this. We do it. You got We're going to do it. Do it. you can hooray fantastic hello everyone it is Ken Haas coming to you not so live from sunny beautiful Toledo Ohio where I have with me today the magnificent the exquisite the tall Greg Cox hey folks thanks for being here Greg it's a, always a pleasure uh, as those of you who are regular purveyors of this channel notice from the other stuff that might be over here or maybe on your computer, it's down there. We have taken the live, uh, the 12 questions format to this sort of live interview thing. And today, it is my pleasure to interview Mr. Greg. Mr. Greg. Yes. You ready for this first I one? I am it's prepared. A it's a toughie. Give us a brief history of your playing career, my friend. I started playing guitar when I was 12. Why? Chicks. Who made me do it? Jim Hendrix. Who tried to talk me out of it? My dad. <laughs> Guess who won? Drade. Okay? That's me. Uh, my nephew used to call me Drade because he couldn't say his G. So if you ever hear me refer to myself in the third person as Drade, it's because my nephew used to call me Drade. It just kind of stuck. Anyway, that's basically what happened. I wanted to play guitar. My dad was a lawyer. He was like, holy hell, my kid's going to be washing cars. Not that there's anything wrong with washing cars. Um, so I always wanted to have my own band and wanted to do my own thing. And it just panned out. I just... Went to school for music, learned what I needed to do to be literate in the musical sense, and started my own band, and uh, was able to get enough things going to kind of enough different spigots of income in order to make a living, and it's all worked out. Thank God. Thank you. I'm so excited about just, you know, being. <laughs> is that weird? I don't think so. I like life. Is that wrong? Maybe it is wrong to the people on YouTube. Sometimes they're sitting around going, do I like life? I don't know. I have to look at the screen to tell me so. And I'm telling you, as a member of the screen, love it! <laughs> so, okay, so other than the angst towards your father... Oh, what, no angst, but it was just... What, what inspired you to first start playing the electric guitar when you were like, that, that there, that's the thing? Oh, well, it started very early. I was a Hendrix fanatic for whatever reason. I used to listen to Hendrix when I was a kid because my brother was older than I was, and I'd listen to these Jimmy records... And he just looked like, okay, first of all, he's the coolest cat to ever walk the earth. There's that. And, and he was just revered as just, you know, like just a superhuman, you know, kind of a member of the uh, Justice League, if you will. But like the president, he's like the Superman of the Justice League, guitar world, rock and roll stardom. Uh, and that was it. So I just, I always wanted to play guitar. And just the sight of like a white Stratocaster, you know, and, and pretty much just like, oh my God. And I'd actually go into a music store and see what I was like. <gasps> But I never actually owned one. But that was the initial uh, intoxication with all things six-stringed. I always wanted to play. I did a report on Jimi Hendrix when I was in third grade. I had a spirited discussion with my teacher, Mr. Stiebner. Mr. Stiebner was not impressed that this third grader was coming around talking about this guy who died from drugs. And I was like, dude, technically it wasn't a drug overdose, okay? Took some strong barbiturates with booze. It was an accident. Same thing Marilyn Monroe died of. But you want to paint him out to be some kind of, you know, Junksman. He wasn't. Sure, he liked to party. Did he like to take acid? Sure. Was he shooting up in street corners? No. Mr. Stiebner? Sorry, I got a little, I get a little upset. What? Maybe Mr. Stiebner is watching this. Hey, well, I hope you've learned your lesson, Mr. <laughs> Stiebner. <laughs> what was your first electric? My first actual electric guitar, I walked proudly into Metropolitan Music in beautiful Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and with the proceeds of my paper route and the, uh, shall we say, gravitas of my lovely father, we walked into that establishment. I looked the individual in the eye and said, show me your glorious assortment of Lotus Les Pauls. Because you could get a Lotus Les Paul for about 150 yeah. And so I got a uh, what looked to be kind of a sunburst black pickguard custom with the coil, cream coils exposed, 
Ooh. Uh, a coily cord and a PV Rage amplifier. Whoa, the Rage, was it a Rage 10? It was indeed. Yes. And it was filled with fury, if we're <laughs> honest. Yeah. Oh, yeah. When dimed, it would bounce around on the floor. It, indeed. Yeah. That guitar didn't last long because it just, it just seemed to have an aversion to staying in tune. <laughs> just didn't want to do it. It, like, actively wouldn't stay in it tune. It willfully uh, withheld proper tonality from the, the user, and that was me. <laughs> so you don't still have it? No, that is long gone. Long gone. Okay. So this is the hard question. You ready? Don't think about it. Okay. Just, just... Answer off the top of your head. Yeah. Top five favorite records. Go. Uh, Axis Bold as Love, Jimi Hendrix. Uh, the White Album by the Beatles. Uh, Almond Brothers, Live at the Fillmore. Uh, Live Cream, Volume 2. Uh, how many is that? Four. Uh, Sticky Fingers, Rolling Stones. Well played. You did that very well. That, that, that tends to be a stumbling block for people sitting in that chair. You know, I, we've, we've had Kringle and coffee, so I'm... I'm kind yeah, of well, you have had Kringle and coffee, that's true. What, back to you, what is the proudest moment of your playing career? That, that moment that you just... I guess the moment to me was, it, I just it immediately came to mind as I was playing a gig years ago in beautiful Milwaukee, Wisconsin at Summerfest, this glorious festival. Absolutely. Yeah. And... Um, I was actually just subbing with a friend of mine's blues band, and uh, we were doing some, it was in the afternoon, four o'clock in the afternoon or so, and he gives me a solo, and I play a solo, and I'm building it up, and I got my eyes closed, I'm going, and I get done with my solo, and the crowd is reacting, you know, nicely, thank you, Milwaukee, whoo, and I turn to my left, and there, like looking from the side of the stage, is Albert King, looking at me like this, and he goes, and the reason why I was so cool is not only is my Albert is Albert King arguably yeah. my favorite blues man of all time, but he is a renowned was a renowned curmudgeon <laughs> and could give two shakes of a you know what about Yeah. So for him to do that was actually like profoundly cool. And so and then afterwards That's I didn't want to talk to him because I had that moment. I didn't want it sullied. Yeah, right, right. Further right. interaction. But the guys that I was with were like, Oh my god, let's ask him to sit in. I'm like, no. No, there's none of that. Stay away from Mr. King. And they went on his bus and they said, Hey, Albert, it looks like you were enjoying it. Do you want to sit in? And he said, F no. <laughs> so <laughs> I was glad I didn't go on the bus, but I had that moment. And of all the things that have happened, and there's been a lot of cool things, that just sticks out as mine. It's one of those just moments of like, Albert King, ladies and gentlemen. I'll always, I'll always have Albert King. That's a great story. I dug it. Wow. So, how did you first hear about Reverend? Well, that's a good that's a good question. I think it was from uh, in the Wildwood world. I think um, I probably heard about it before then, but the first time I got my mitts on it was when I was out at Wildwood checking out the guitars. That's where I met you. Yeah, and started checking out all the axes, and um, that's there. It is in a nutshell. Yeah, I mean there is. Much video documentation, right? And the um, only reason why interactions. I guess the only reason <laughs> I wouldn't have known about it before then is because, having uh, been associated with uh, you know the Big F for so long, yeah. When I would go to, I'd go to like Nam shows and stuff like that. I would be uh, worked like a farm animal all day long. I enjoyed it. Don't get me wrong. But by the time, I didn't go out on the floor to see other stuff because I was just being. Boom. And then all of a sudden, string, ding, ding, it'd be at 6 o'clock at the end of the day, and people are, hey, are you going to go out to see this show? Are you going to do this? And then I'm like, I'm going to make something very clear. There's food and bed in my future, and that's what would always happen. So I was kind of, I was kind of um, extricated from the guitar community at, at large because I was uh, just doing that what I had sense. to do to make some, some, <laughs> to rock and make some dinero for the home fire. You know, sport kids are expensive as well. You know. Oh, I have four of those things. Yes. Yeah, they do. They yeah. cost money. They do indeed. <laughs> they do indeed. Even you're at least making one earn. Yes. You know, I have a drummer as well. Yes. Yeah, but he's he's more of a yeah. He's a marcher. He's a marcher. I don't I don't know what the future is. 
But maybe having a guy with a snare drum marching back and forth across the stage I could be a new thing. Could be. You never know. Yeah. You know, speaking of kids, i got to tell a story because I just thought of it this oh, morning. Cause okay. Cause Excellent. Because I, I saw <laughs> Rick Vito and I were having a, a breakfast this morning in the hotel. This young lady came down with just this gorgeous little bambino. We said, what a cute kid. Smiling at everybody. We're like, look at that cute kid. And I, immediately I thought of this story when I was a kid. When I was Mr. Momming it, my first two, Dylan and Grace were about two years apart, and we had moved into a new house in this little subdivision of the Milwaukee area, Wauwatosa, Wisconsin. And I'm walking with a wagon with the two kids in it. Beautiful spring day, walking in my new neighborhood, and I see a guy mowing his lawn, and he's about my age now, then, right? Mowing his lawn, doing his thing. He looks over, does a double take at me, doesn't know me from Adam, I don't know him, walking with the kids. He turns off the lawnmower, he walks over, he looks at the two kids, he looks at me, he goes, just wait. And he turns around, and just proceeds to go on his merry way. Never saw him again, never talked to him any more than that, that was that. Now imagine what had happened to that guy that day with one of his, I'm assuming, adult children or, or perhaps something. high schoolers. It's probably something to warrant such a savage action. <laughs> and I have since then, my wife will occasionally <laughs> see a young couple with kids. She goes, are you going to do it to them? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to play that forward. <laughs> I'm not going to do it. Wow. I've, well, it's going to be hard to get back on track after that. <laughs> that, was, that, is, that is savage. I like that. That's yeah, funny. Only in Wauwatosa. Yeah. Uh, you know, we, uh, I always ask in this thing, what Reverend guitars are you using? Uh, in, and it's fun with a signature artist, of course, because you're using the Gristle Master. Cause oh, I actually, you, I use uh, quite a few of them. And, uh, but all, but yes, also. Well, I really, um, I really love the Space Hawk, Reeves Cabell Space yeah. Hawk. I love that guitar. I love the out of phase ability to get, the, and it's a really good, and with the bass contour, you can, a lot of time with the out of phase thing, as we all know, we've messed with it. We love the way it sounds on record, but in practice, it always seems to be a little AM radio-ish when we're playing it. But with that bass contour, you can really dial in a sound that's very usable. And then Sweet. you got the fact that you got the, uh, um, you know, the, res the, the treble bleed thing on the volume control. You don't lose any highs. So that's good. And plus, the doggone Bigsby works. You can use it. Instead of looking at it going, I know it looks cool, and I like the idea of wiggling it, but as soon as I do, I'm going to go into some pan-Egyptian tuning. Not that there's anything wrong with those tunings, if that's where you want to roll. But if you want to stay in ta standard tuning, yeah. yes. uh, you can use it and at your discretion, and it sounds magnificent. So I've got one of those. I also have uh, that Pete Anderson baritone, the East Side East Sider baritone. I've been using that on a nightly basis, and that thing, stand clear and stand firm. The descent is very cool as well, but the C to C thing has just got an, especially in that bridge pickup, it's got an extra little quack a racka. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then I have one of the um, uh, PA one, is it the uh, the arch toppy? Yeah, thing? yeah. And I've got the Fishman Fluence uh, humbuckers in there, and that's in deep. Uh, what kind of never remember the color? Deep sea blue. Deep sea blue. Yeah. Satin it's deep not, sea blue. It's not hard. Deep just sea think, blue. Think Satan deep sea blue. All right, there we go. Locked uh, in. And I love that doggone thing. And yeah. uh, that's a hell of a rock guitar. It's it really is. I mean, it really, it does a lot of things, but it's not, uh, it, you know, I mean, obviously it does the jazzy thing. Yes. And it, it does the blues thing exceptionally, especially with the P90 version of it. Yeah. But, um, but that guitar rocks. Yes. I mean, it, it, there's uh, some sort of weird, like, almost Birdland tones going on there for some reason. I don't there know are, indeed. Is. I love that guitar. It's fabulous. Yeah. So. Yeah, there, there are many. Um, well, we already know what you like about your Reverend guitars. Uh, what uh, Talk about your amp. What, wait, what amps and pedals are you using? I know you have a signature amplifier and yes. a signature pedal. Fire that, away. That's correct. Well, well people. Uh, the signature amplifier was something that um, was a happy accident of a sort. Um, you know, for years, I, I, I guess the amp that I probably used the longest would be uh, the Vibrolux. Fender Vibrolux, uh, custom Vibrolux was what they came out with in 1996, and I probably used, I've got two of those. That's a good, uh, Rick Vito's using one of mine yeah. on this tour that we're on right now. Uh, but about three years ago or so, I got hooked up with the uh, amplifier company that has my same last name, Koch, or is, I think they say Koch, but in really in, in German or in Dutch it would be Koch, get a little spit in there. 
and it's good for you. It's the name that serves as an expectorant, and so if you're suffering from a cold, just say my name, and you're going to be on the road to recovery. That sounded weird. But um, anyway, so I started, uh, I was at a, uh, actually Music Mesa for Fishman, and right across the uh, lane of, I guess we'd say aisle, of booths, there was the Cock Amplifier people. And Dolph Cock and his lovely wife came over. Dolph. Dolph. And uh, he name. goes, you know, my wife and I are fans of your, your band. We know we've got your CDs and stuff like that. That's funny because I'm actually fans of, I'm a fan of your amps because I've played a few, you know, on my travels and so on and so forth. And we both started saying, wouldn't it be funny if we worked together? And I'm like, well, that's a no-brainer. Um, and then I took a little picture next to a stack of amps with, you know, it said cock on it and posted it on the inner Google. People were like, oh, of course. And um, just like that. They even commented in a little comment. Bur -bur 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 Kind of I am like often asked how you have time to do all the things that you do and run the amp company at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. <laughs> so to make a long story short, we started talking about what would I'd want in a signature amplifier. And because uh, I liked the, the, the way that their amps were set up to begin with, uh, but because I was such a Vibrolux fan, I liked the sound of 210s. I just like yeah. the tightness of 210s. I like the way they throw. I dig it. Uh, so I was like, well, I want a 210 amp. Uh, and I really, it's one of the only amps, because uh, I don't usually like a two-channel amp, I usually like an amp with a one volume on it that you set, and then you use it as a platform to either crank it all the way up and use the volume knob on your guitar, yeah. uh, or, you know, most reasonably to put it on, you know, four or so, and then use a pedal to kick it above and beyond. But I really like the channel switching on the amps. It actually worked. You go from a really good clean sound to an overdrive sound that was a, you know, it didn't sound like you were switching to an entirely different, different amp. Different amplifier, they complemented each other. Right. Uh, so I said, listen, I would like an amp that has your glorious clean sound, but some way to dirty up that clean sound just a skosh if I want to. Then I want your lead sound, which I really dig. It's very plexi ish 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 I don't know what any of that is. Works for and, those and then you can nine chords. Exactly. And then you can add a little overdrive boost on top of that. Um, and then I wanted a harmonic vibrato on board. I wanted a glorious reverb. Anyways, they did it, and it sounds fantastic. Prior to that, to get that kind of gain staging, um, I had a pedal that was developed for me by a buddy I went to college with, and we've, we've actually sold quite a few over the years. It's been around for a while. This is actually the third iteration, but it's, uh, it's called the Gristle King. First, there was an overdrive pedal uh, that he made for me called the Diabolical Gristle Tone Manipulator, the DGTM, if you will. Uh, and he had this Clean Boost pedal, which was not really titled as gloriously, it was just called the Luxury Drive. And the Clean Boost was really, really good. It just made the world a better place when you had it on. Yeah. So I said, hey, what if we took the Clean Boost and put it on with the Overdrive, um, and we had that in one paddle? He goes, outstanding idea, let's call it the Gristle King. I'm like, bam! So that's what we did. And so it allows you to have a, a Clean Boost and then an Overdrive on top of that. And if I have to do a throw and go or I'm flying in someplace, I'll bring that pedal and just plug it into a twin, super reverb, an orange, whatever they have, and it's, it sounds great. And then he made a third iteration for me called the Triple Gristle. I don't talk about that one too much because we sold a few from the site, but it took him forever to make them. He's like, oh, let's do a batch of 50 from my site and 50 from your site. And I sold out immediately, and they took like a year to deliver. Uh. And it was, but we, all, we deliver, and everyone loves them, and I love mine because the, it's got a fuzz on it. So it's got a clean boost, it's got the overdrive, and it's got a gr really usable fuzz that lives well with all the, the with the two other pedals, and then there's a buffer on board too in case you need to, you know, you need something where you need a buffer for it. So it, that's the pedal I kind of grab and go with when I need to. It sounds diabolical. As a matter of fact, on the Cock Marshall Trio record, most of the record was done uh, using having the clean boost and actually the fuzz on the whole time. And then I plugged into it, and then I just used the volume knob on the guitar to turn it down, cleaned up, turn it up. So the fuzz is real dynamic. Absolutely. So, and you're, now you're into the clean boost thing. Is, is that essentially what's going on with the button on your Fishman? Uh, no, it's, it's, it's a mean, different thing. this is thing. more of a mid-range thing, right? Uh, well, yeah, it adds this mid-range and a little bit of dB boost. <laughs> Um, and, the, and the idea is because these Fluence pickups, that you know, they're multi-voiced pickups sure, because sure. there's a preamp in there. So uh, the party line is, is that you have to imagine that when you're pressing this button, it's like you've taken out these pickups and put another set in that happen to be a little bit more overwound and are voiced a little meatier. Okay. So it's not adding anything to the first voice. It's a second voice that just happens to be meatier and more of an output than the first one. 
and and they are dig okay and they are fashioned after the the first voicing is more like a what we call it, like a white guard telly so more something of the 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 mid to late 50s or early 60s uh and then when you press the button it's more of a black guard telly so it's a little meatier a little bit more high output <laughs> You know, it's not real drastic, but it certainly comes in handy. So a lot of times when I'm playing, if I'm doing some kind of clean comping, I'll have the uh, the button up. And if I do it like a clean lead, I'll press that button in. Just adds a little bit of something, something. So when you're using the clean boost in your pedal board, is it so, it, it, it's something that you just like to leave on. Most of the time, yeah. Yeah, and you just like to push the front end of the amp a little bit? I yeah. Mean, is that a I mean, I've, that's what I got actually right now. I just got that little the, the EP, EP, EP booster. booster yeah. Just keep it on. Yeah. It just makes everything a little more sinuous from the get. Excellent. Well, that's a lot of gear talk. Damn straight. Huh. Weird how that happens. So, Greg, tell us. Yeah. Do you have any unusual hobbies that you'd like to share with us outside of... Eating Tony Packles, which I don't think is that unusual. I think that's a delicious, delicious yeah. habit. Uh, you know what? I really don't. You know, I uh, I like to read a lot of books. I like to walk. I'm a walking <laughs> son of a gun. Yeah, I knew you were a walker. What, what, what style of books do you like to read? Fiction, nonfiction, detectives, uh, World uh, War II, anything? Uh, I read a lot of history stuff, and it, it varies. I get into different interests, uh, different little tangents that I'll go on. Uh, I read a lot of, um, I read some spiritual tomes, things, mysteries of the East. Oh, okay. Unfolding. Uh, what else do I do? I like to, I, I'm a walking son of a gun. Have I mentioned that? Yeah. I don't really play sports. I don't really, you know, I don't bowl. I don't fish. I don't really, I don't hunt. Uh, I basically reproduce and play guitar. Interesting. Uh, which is kind of... Huh, that, you know, that is actually, that's been said about me as well. Well, yeah. you know, and here we are. Yeah, here we are. Here but, we are. Uh, yeah, no, nothing really unusual. I, there was a while there where I would uh, go to various Civil War battlefields, and it was kind of into that for a hot second, but... That's cool. Been uh, to Antietam? I've been to Antietam. Actually, my... That's an interesting one. My great-great-grandfather lost his arm in the Battle of Antietam. Really? Uh, he was a that's German immigrant, uh, moved to New York, and was... Uh, probably made an offer he couldn't understand to fight in the Union Army uh, and lost his arm. Uh, and then afterwards, he stayed in the Army. He was actually a quartermaster in the Union Army. He was on uh, Grant's staff uh, at the time of the uh, surrender at um, Appomattox. Crazy. Interesting. Well, that'll be a good story. Anyway. I could have just made it up, yeah. but I didn't. Uh, and well, no, because if you me when you make cups stuff like that, then people get on the inner Googles and then they, they can check figure it out. They could, right? Yes, and then they stalk you online and tell you that you're a liar. That's right. We but don't want that. It's uh, yeah, you can look up John Koch, Johannes Koch. I, I like that. I have one more question for you. Yes. Uh, what advice do you have for up and coming players? Those guys sitting there watching you right now, going, "I'm going to shred like Greg." You know what? I was thinking about this the other day. If I could give advice to my younger self, yeah, uh, I would. Um, I've, I've always given people way too much credit, and what do I mean by that? Ken, I'm not, it's, that's not like saying people are full of schnikey. It's just that <laughs> I think you know you're thinking that there is some kind of uh, true north, both musically and philosophically, and so on. And there really isn't. There's just people and their opinions. So when you do your thing, if it feels good to you and you're questing for quality and you're doing the best that you can do, it shouldn't matter what anybody else thinks. And so often we think, oh, if I just do this, so-and-so will hear it and they will like it. Most likely they won't because they have their heads so far up their own dank after passage that they're on a first name basis with potential polyp growth, okay? So what you wanna do, ladies and gentlemen, is you just wanna quest for excellence and not give two shakes of a shite what anybody else thinks. Now, granted, you have to commodify what you're doing if you want to make a living doing it, but still, you can do so in a very productive way. That way, you can enjoy everything. Everyone's got their own flavor of what they do. It's not a competition. Do your own thing 
and not really care if someone's like, well, yeah, that's okay, but you know, Slidey Joe McCorkendale does it better. Well, good for Slidey Joe. I'm Drade, and I'm doing my own thing, or you may be Philip Masusical, and you're gonna do whatever you're gonna do, and don't care if somebody goes, well, that's not blues, you don't write good songs, I don't like your voice. Because no matter how many hundreds of people will say they like it, all it takes is that one person to say it, and we go, what's wrong with my voice? What's wrong with it? Don't listen to it. Just do your own thing. That's what I would say. The most successful people that I know have always stayed in their lane. Yeah. And because if you try to, you know, especially the, I, in the rock music thing, I, I've made some interesting decisions over the years, you know, but the bands and things that I've stuck with, are things that I really enjoy doing. Yes. You know, I really jo enjoy being in that Silly Polka Floyd band. I love that and band. And there, uh, there was a minute there when when, uh, when the lovely Miss Penny decided she didn't want to play anymore, and before the lovely Miss Penny left, when, when our original accordion player left, where it was like, yeah, maybe this has played itself out. And then I did, a, I finished out a couple of shows on the schedule as like a, a three-piece because I had stuff booked, and I was doing it, and I'm like, wait, I like this. Like, I'm having fun. Absolutely. And that's the most important thing. And that is, that is the most important thing. And I've seen a lot of bands, I've seen a lot of people, like, try to adjust their, adjust their playing for something that is Right. As trending. I like to say, in the music business, this is my analogy, and it may be screwed up, but I played basketball for a very short period of time. Okay. But I always remember, because I was big, you always box out for a, re for, for a rebound, right? You know, we got to box out. So I came up with the analogy for the music business, that everyone's boxing out for a rebound that's not coming in a game that barely exists. So therefore, <laughs> just do your thing and enjoy the moment. It's always like, oh, if I just do this and this and this, at some point on down the line, I'm going to be happy. It's like, no, all you have no, is now. Be, make be it happy now. Be happy now. Yeah. Yeah, enjoy. It, I can dig it. Yeah. Play us out. All right, Cass, Thanks for we'll coming in, Greg. My pleasure.